Good morning. Welcome to another week of worship online. We each bring different emotions and feelings and experiences from the week into this time, and yet we approach the same God, the living God. And so for the next several moments, there will be a scripture on the screen. And this week, I simply invite you to reflect upon the truth and the hope that comes from this scripture as we together worship this morning.
morning and welcome to online worship. I'm Pastor Sharon. You know, regardless of the circumstances around us, I'm grateful that we can continue to say that our purpose as a church goes forward. We seek to love God passionately, to love others deeply, and to bless the world radically. We do it imperfectly, but it's good to be together in this. If you're new to connecting with us online, a special welcome to you. We're grateful that you've joined us. If you feel comfortable, we'd love for you to put your name and, and maybe where you're connecting with us in the comments below. We'd love to connect with you. If you'd like to receive our weekly e-news, simply send a, an email request to office at plcc.org and we'll make sure that gets sent out to you. Even during this time, we're looking for fresh and unique ways to connect with families. And one of those is our upcoming Backyard Sports Club. It will be held the week of August 10th through the 14th. An opportunity for about an hour each day to have high energy activities and things for you to do with your kids. Um, resources will be provided for you and a bag for each participant, including a water bottle, some snacks and a camper booklet. You can find out more details and sign up for this online at plcc.org slash sports club. The other thing that we've been planning for in these weeks has been a way to say goodbye to Pastor Mark and Patty. We had hoped to have in-person gatherings, but because of the increase of COVID in our community, we have had to shift some of those plans. So let me tell you though, two opportunities you still have to say goodbye and to honor Mark and Patty in this season. The first is a stop and chat visit that's gonna be held at their home. You can find, you can have an exclusive time in their uh, driveway, socially distanced to say a uh, tribute and to speak to Mark and Patty. You can find out what dates are available for that and a time to sign up for it online at plcc.org slash farewell. The second thing that we're going to do is host and stream a event on Facebook on Saturday, August 1st, 1st at 4 p.m. You're welcome to join us for that, to hear tributes to Mark and his ministry with us for the past eight years. And you can also interact live as you put comments on the Facebook feed. Immediately after that event, we will be gathering for a Zoom call where you can interact with Mark and Patty for a last time. We hope you'll be part of these events where we can say thank you to a ministry that's been so impactful in our community. Good morning, I'm Pastor Nancy, and it's time for our Kairos Kids Moment. Preschoolers, elementary students, even little ones, come a little bit closer to the screen and make sure you have your rock wall or your memento container with you. We add rocks when we use our Bibles and learn God's word, when we practice the remember verse and share it with others, and when we see God around us at work, our God sightings where we see him active in our lives and the world around us. So kids, go ahead and add your God sightings, your mementos now, and I'll add some to mine as well. I'm going to add some for our snack and story time where we played uh, some games and shared some stories with preschoolers this week. I'm going to add some for my Bible time where I spent time with God and sensed him so close. And I'm going to add some for our backyard sports club that's coming up because I trust that God is in the planning and in the details for us. We also add rocks when we share the remember verse. So let's look at this screen and say this out loud together. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 33. of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Continue our worship as we pray together. Holy God, Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for showing us who we are and who you are. We're moved again today by your holiness, your goodness, your grace. 
and we worship you with eyes open in wonder because you are worthy of all we could ever bring. Thank you that even in our brokenness, Lord, we can come with confidence of your love, your forgiveness. Thank you. Lord, we pray today for the church, for Pine Lake Covenant Church and for your church in this community and around the world. Lord, give all of us eyes of faith to see that you're at work even in these times of challenge. Keep our pastors and leaders centered on you and attentive to the needs of others. And inspire each of us, Lord, to live boldly as members of your church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our everyday lives. Lead us, we pray, to love those around us. Lord, we pray today as well for those who don't yet know your goodness and love, people in our neighborhoods, in our own families, who are far from you. Oh God, give us sensitive yet courageous hearts to move toward them, to share your love, to share our own stories so that more, more people might know your love. And Lord, we bring today before you those who are in a special time of need. We think of those who need healing, for those who need employment, for those who are facing times of extra anxiety and loneliness. Oh God, you see them, you know them, and each one of us are aware of names that come to mind even now, of people who need to know your care. So we bring them before your throne of mercy, because you are the source of all things. We ask, Lord, that you bring your healing power, you bring your comforting presence to those who are in special needs. And Lord, we pray all of this in confident faith. You are the one who holds all things together. You hold creation together, you hold us together. And may that give us confidence as we bring these prayers to you. We pray it in the name of Jesus, our brother. Amen. This month, we have concluded both a three-year Accelerate the Vision campaign and a five-year 2020 vision. And both of these campaigns have been really pictures of God's faithfulness and the ways that He has provided for our church in order to do the ministry that we've been called to do. And so now as we turn to this new season that brings so much uncertainty to us as a church, I want to remind you that it is because of your giving that good ministry continues to unfold through Pine Lake Covenant Church. And so as you consider giving this morning, there's two ways to do so. First, you can go to plcc.org slash give. And in addition, you can text any amount to 725-444-9490. And as you consider giving this morning, I invite you to read this prayer aloud with me this morning. God, we offer these gifts to you as an act of worship, for all we have is yours. Amen. Good morning, my name is Britta. And my name is Annika, and we're the Banal Sisters. Today's scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1-10. through 10. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. 
we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I really want to say how much I've enjoyed doing this, this last series that has allowed me to uh, focus in on some of the main themes in my, uh, my life and also in the main thing in the Bible, in the person of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And uh, today, uh, I want to explore something that's always fascinated me, and that is the relationship between the Bible and the modern psychology movement, and particularly the word shame. And it's a huge uh, topic in the Bible that begins in the, in the Garden of Eden. That's where shame gets introduced with those fig leaves, you know, and... and um, there, there was shame there, and then it, it carries on all the way through. And shame is part of our life today, but in a traditional culture, traditional cultures are characterized by shame and honor. There's kind of this dance that goes back and forth between shame and honor. And if, you're, if you have honor, then you're a good member of the community, and if you have shame, you're put outside the community. It's, it's uh, just the way traditional culture is, and that's what the Bible is uh, based in a traditional culture. We are moderns and we think a lot of times that we're beyond that. And of course, you know, and I know that shame is very much a part of our interior life. And it's also very much a part of our world. And so if you were to go on to uh, social media and post something that uh, was very inappropriate, you would be, uh, the community of correctness would soon let you know about that. And there is a strong shaming in the political world, which we touched on last week, but both the left and the right are, are there's just so much shaming going on right now in our world. So I think it's hugely relevant to us uh, in, in, this, in this time. Now, to shame uh, someone, if you do it socially, it's to say to that person that they are worthless, they are bad, uh, that's kind of the messaging there. It's real simple, but it's really dark. And then what happens is it's not just a social message. It becomes a, a psychological message that we internalize and we say, I am bad. I am worthless. I am not valuable. And so uh, it, has, it has relevance in, in both ways. And I have this sense that, or I guess I call it a hope, that because shame is such a big thing in our world, that and that the message of the Bible is very much an answer to that shame, that people would realize who God is and want him in their lives and have way less shame. Shame's gonna always be there in some measure, but we can grow and we can become less shame-based. So that's where hopefully where we're gonna go today. Well, I wanna to just say a few things. Uh, this is the number six of seven, and last or next week will be, our, uh, be my last Sunday to preach here. And acknowledge that uh, we would want to, and I say we, Patty and I would wanna say goodbye to everybody in just the best way. And, and we're, you know, obviously that's a hard thing right now to struggle to do that, but there's some opportunities that we'll have and um, I also wanted to say that uh, this next week, I'm going to be doing all of the daily um, devotionals or reflections, I guess they're called. And uh, so if, if you want to catch that, uh, I'll see you there. But this morning, I want to uh, address this uh, shame topic and, uh, in, in three parts. Uh, it, the question of Paul in verses 4 or, or chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, 2 Corinthians, is, uh, is he going to be shame-based or is he going to be radiant? Because you'll see both of those concepts there. And then secondly, we'll look at the treasure that's in these jars of clay. And then the third thing is uh, to introduce another metaphor for our own beauty that might be healing for us. So let's get into uh, the first thing then is, is in chapter 4. Uh, verse 1, Paul mentions that we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. And that, isn't that, doesn't that sound wonderful? Like something you'd want to say? And the, the we for Paul is a reminder that he always has friends with him. 
and he's kind of a leader, but uh, there's always a we, it seems, with Paul. And it's his strength. His friendships are his strength. And so for us, and we're going to get through this pandemic and not lose heart if we have friends. And that's going to make it a whole lot better. But uh, we, we, this uh, encouragement to not lose heart, Paul's going to deal with that as he goes through this passage. And there's something there for us in general uh, as we try to go through this time uh, and not lose heart. But let's get more specific. And what's going on in Corinth is it seems that Paul is being ashamed or there are those who are trying to shame Paul. And then we're going to see that they're not successful. So uh, what are they, what are, why would they try to shame Paul? Well, he, we know from elsewhere that, and particularly in Corinth, he had kind of a rocky relationship with the church in Corinth. And we have two letters. And we know that uh, there were some that didn't consider him a real apostle. And we know that there were some who didn't consider him very gifted. We get that from the first letter to the Corinthians. And then in 2 Corinthians, we have these uh, both here in the last verses that were read and later on in this letter, we have these instances where Paul is a lot of bad stuff is happening to Paul. And somebody could say to about Paul, you know, Paul, you really don't have a very God blessed life. Look at all the bad things that happened to you. You're shipwrecked. You have uh, all these times where you get beaten up. And uh, anyway, it's a, it's a long list that and, and so we don't know exactly, but somebody is trying to shame Paul. And Paul's response to that is simply to say, look, I don't use shameful uh, spin. I don't try to deceive. I don't, the only thing I'm going to do is speak the truth. And then uh, the, the, from that, Paul defends himself against whoever this is. And the first line of defense is to say, look, when I speak the truth, not every, sure, not everybody responds to it in a positive way. And he gives the reason for that, that people can't see the beauty of Christ. Uh, they've been blinded by the God of this world. They can't see the beauty in the life of Christ. And remember, I, I heard this recently about Jesus that just it caught me, that with all of the superpowers or supernatural powers that he had, the amazing things that he did, never once did he use those powers to advance his own interests or to increase his comfort or his wealth or his family's comfort or wealth or interests. Never once. And how many people can you, if you think about this world, how many people could you say that about? It's, is that not beautiful? I mean, I think that's beautiful. There's something in me that is attracted to that beauty. But Paul is probably speaking more of the death of Christ when he, he talks about people not seeing the glory of Christ or the beauty of Christ. And it's not obvious that because the cross was a place that was pretty darn ugly. And to be able to see that Christ actually chose to go there for us, that's where the beauty lies. And not everybody can see it. They, they just see a, another, you know, if you're in the first century, there were lots of crosses. Lots of people died on crosses. And, you know, another man dying on a cross, so what? It would have been the attitude of some as Paul uh, put this truth out there. But he's not, here's the point. Paul is not responsible for people's reactions to him. He's not responsible for how people respond to him. He puts it out there and he lets it go. Okay, so he's not shamed by that accusation. Secondly, he's not shamed because he preaches not himself, or he, he's not communicating about himself. He's communicating about Christ. And uh, he, has, he has this sense of, of peace that comes when he's just, he's talking about Christ. Now, if he was concerned about himself and somebody criticized him, of course, he's going to be devastated. You know, if, if we're dependent on other people to affirm us, then just one word of criticism is going to bring us down every time. That, that's, a, that's a clue that shame is operating in us. 
when we are really sensitive to people's criticism of us. And, and Paul didn't have that. He's, he's all about Christ. So here we have this principle, the main thing. Paul is keeping the main thing, the main thing. The main thing is Jesus Christ and his gospel. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is where Paul says that this, this uh, glory is actually shining. This is the word radiant now. I mean, it's, it's related to the word radiant. This glory of Christ is shining in his heart. So he's not just proclaiming it with his mouth, but it, it, it lives in him. And let's, let's just slow down here a little bit and think about Jesus and shame. So the cross was, um, I guess you could say, perfectly designed to maximize not only physical pain, but psychological shame. I mean, you couldn't, I can't imagine anything better at doing shame than the cross. So you're, it's very public. It's outside of the city. So shame always puts people out of community. It's outside the city, public, on the main road, in and out of the city. He's totally naked, regardless of whatever artwork you've seen. And he is being spit on and mocked. I mean, it is, it is, can you imagine anything more shameful? And yet, the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, verse 2, that Christ scorned the shame that was heaped upon him. And that he was able to do that because he was fixed on obeying his father. And he knew what his mission was. So he, Christ did not experience the shame of the cross. I mean, it was, it was put upon him, but he didn't absorb it into himself. That's a beautiful picture. Now, this is the Christ that's living and shining and radiating through Paul. It's a beautiful picture. I want to tell you a, a story uh, that happened in 1996. And in my Bible... Uh, when, in, in some places at least, when I have a, a story that relates to a verse in my Bible, I'll make a little notation there with a name and a date. And I have this notation in Psalm 34, verse 5. I'll get that up in a minute, but I want to tell you the story first. Um, I was a, a new pastor to Alaska. This was in the first year of, of being in Alaska. And this pastor's conference for our pastors was, at, when Jesus talked about the ends of the earth, this was officially what he was talking about. Nunavak Island in the Bering Sea. So it's an island out in the Bering Sea. And then there's this little village there called Makoryuk. And um, I was there uh, f- for this conference and I, I was walking back from the, the church where we were meeting to the home where I was staying. And it was April. So in my Bible, it says April 16th of 1996. And um, I was so cold. It, it, I know it was April, but it felt like middle of January and the snow was blowing sideways that uh, I, I went into a, uh, a laundromat that was there in the village. And of course, you know, laundromat, you know, I'm smart enough to know that it's usually a warm place. And I sat down and I began to read and uh, I got into a conversation with a woman named Jean. So I have, I have her name written next to this verse in my Bible. And Jean began to tell me her story. I told her I was a pastor, and first time I've ever been to that village. I never, I've never been back. But uh, she told me uh, about her life and how she had grown up in that village. And like a lot of uh, Native Alaskan uh, young people, they go to Anchorage. And now she had come back. But what happened when she went to Anchorage is that she ended up living on the streets and and alcoholism was very much a part of that. And um, it, her story uh, goes deeper than that. There was, as with many Alaska Native women, there was sexual abuse in her story. And so there was, and there was shame associated with that, very common. And so the shame associated with that, the alcoholism, streets of Anchorage, and now 
trying to get her life back together. She comes back to her village and is involved there in the church where I was, um, where my conference was. And so we were, we were talking about this, but as she talked about uh, her life and, and allowing Christ into her life, she began to radiate. Now, I, I don't know how else to say it, but she lit up and she quoted this verse. Now, go, I'll go ahead and put that verse on there for you. This is from um, Psalm, yeah, uh, Psalm 34, verse 5. I'll read it for you. Those who look to him, that would be to God, and we would say to, who look to Christ are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. And if you think about what what shame is and what it does to your face, just think about what it does to your face. It's the opposite of radiance. And I want you to think of Paul as he's writing this letter and as he's living his life to have, and people are trying to put shame on him, but he's not going for it. He's able to resist other people putting shame on him. And he does that, you know, first of all, he's focused on the truth and the truth, of course it's not received by everybody, but that's not a shame to him. He focuses on speaking about Christ, not himself. And speaking about Christ and not himself is an uh, antidote to shame. And then the third thing is he has Christ who resisted shame living in him. And he radiates Christ. So that's, a, that's how Paul handles this. And the invitation there is for us as well. Okay, so now he goes to the, the jars of clay, the treasure in the jars of clay. He wants to give us an image. He's teaching. And so a good metaphor would be this jar of clay. So we're the jar. Paul is just saying, and, and the word for jar here, uh, it, the jars of clay would be, the image would be one that's not decorated or painted or fancy in any way. It's just everyday, ordinary jar of clay. It's not special, but what's in the jar is the treasure. And that's what Paul is, is getting at here. So uh, it's, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful picture. Um, and this is Paul. I want to just bring out this one thing with Paul because he, he says it elsewhere that he is the worst of sinners the absolute worst of sinners. And he also calls himself the scum of the earth. And those are two extreme sayings of Paul. And yet, I want to argue that when he's saying that, he's not doing the self-loathing thing that you might think. Because elsewhere, he says, uh, follow my example. Be like me, Paul says. What what Paul has discovered is in not allowing shame to define who he is, he's able to say things like that and not experience the shame of them. And Paul has great ego strength without a big ego. So the strength of ego, that positive, healthy strength of ego, you could call it self-esteem if you want, but he doesn't have the big ego that comes from thinking that you're the treasure. And his life is full of joy. Now, uh, I wanted to just reference a, a, a modern writer on shame, Andy Crouch, has some real insight here. And what he's saying is that, um, and remember what shame is, it's that, that voice that says you're worthless, and it's both social or psychological and social, or, and we hear it from others and we absorb it into ourselves. And um, what, what he, he says is that, yes, uh, traditional culture functions on this, this, um, in this sort of shame, honor kind of dance. And, um, and that to be a person of honor is to be in the community. But he also, but he says modern culture, we, we changed it to it's now shame and fame. And here's how he says that, that the, we believe that the way to uh, avoid shame or to sort of inoculate ourselves against shame is to brand ourselves. And this is where he's getting at here is social media, but you could probably do it in other ways. 
and to uh, try to to try to make ourselves famous. And by making ourselves famous, we we build ourselves up enough so that we don't have to experience that that shame. But what he's saying is that it doesn't work. And uh, we know it doesn't work because we still have those voices, the psychological voices inside of us. And all we're really doing, to use Paul's imagery, is we're redecorating the jar of clay to try to make it look better. And we're still not, we still don't have that treasure in us. And it's really a fruitless effort. So I share that with you. I'm trying to help us get out of our shame base into something that would free us up to be radiant the radiance of Christ. So I want to give you one more, this, this other imagery that I came across. Uh, Patty and I were, uh, we came across this a while ago. It just really struck me. And it has to do with a Japanese art form called kintsugi. kintsugi and, or kintsugi, I guess it is, the harji. But uh, I'm going to show you some pictures in just a moment, but I'll try to describe it first. It it's about 500 years old, and we, we heard uh, a, a Japanese Christian talking about it, and it was so engaging, it's so neat, and it fits kind of into this sort of with the jar of clay thing. But when a ceramic, let's just say a ceramic jar, if you were to drop it, it would be in pieces. It would be broken. And this art form is about, you know, what would we do in Western culture? Well, we would either throw it away as worthless, or we would get our super glue out and try to make it look like it did before. But this art form takes that, those broken pieces of ceramic and it puts them back together with gold filling. And so the word kintsugi means uh, rejoining gold. And I want you to think, this is, this was the, uh, this artist was talking about, think of this gold as the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's really the treasure that has found its way into the cracks. And it, if you think of your life as uh, uh, pieces of, of broken pottery, it has wonderful redemptive meaning to us. So I'll go ahead and put those. I've got two different slides here to show you what this looks like and how beautiful it is. And the thing to uh, maybe point out here is that when it's, so you have the original, um, you know, there was an original jar that was broken. Well, this is way more valuable. It's way more beautiful. And now it's way stronger than the original is how it comes out. Now think about that for yourself, for myself that we are these clay pots and we're in pieces, we're in fragments. And God is in the business of putting us back together, using the gospel to fill in those cracks, to make us beautiful. To, to, it's really a healing image, isn't it? There he's, think of the scars in your life as those lines. And what does he fill those scars with? but the gospel in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but I just find that really, really attractive. And my hope is that you can see yourself as one of these kintsugi clay pots that are so beautiful. Can you see yourself can you see the beauty of the gospel in you? Can you see how there's no shame in those lines? That those lines are a part of your beauty as God gets a hold of them. You are beautiful. Let us pray. Lord, um, the, I guess the first thing we need to do is just confess that we are far too shame-based we are prone to listening to the voices of other people and then our own voices of self-loathing. And not to your voice, Lord, that brings healing to our lives. 
your voice that it actually you do treasure us, Lord. We are your treasure. If you are our treasure, there's such healing in our lives. Thank you for these images, Lord, from the Apostle Paul and through the Japanese art form. Thank you, Lord, for um, you're the author of all of that, ultimately. So we thank you for that. And I want to, um, uh, I just want to pray and um, for all of us to enter into this prayer and to really think deeply about our um, ourselves as clay pots or clay jars and to imagine ourselves being poured into or to imagine ourselves being healed in those broken places. And, you know, whether it's for the first time or in a renewed way, to see the reality of God's grace and to give in to it and to thank God for it and to say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You are beautiful. I love you, Lord. You have made me beautiful. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen.
God made his light to shine in our hearts, Paul says. And uh, what, a, what a beautiful uh, thing to think about. And that, that light that's shining in there just doesn't have room for the shame. And um, I pray that that's true for all of us. And as we go into this week, may we shine brightly with the light of Christ in us. Go in Christ. Amen. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for worship this morning. It's been so good to worship together in this way. I want to invite you to join us for Encore Online. Over the past several weeks, we've been spending time to get to know Pastor Mark and Patty better, and we're going to be doing just that this week as well. And so please join us for Encore www.pocc.org backslash encore or follow the instructions on the next screen coming up. Hope to see you soon.